being a professional model, what got you even interested in fashion to begin with? Um, I mean, there are several ways how I got interested in nuclear. The first, I would say, was having an interest in science in general. So I got interested in science a long time ago when I read a book uh, written by Richard Dawkins about evolution. And, you know, I didn't know anything about evolution at the time. So I just, you know, it blew my mind and I started doing a ton of research. And once you start learning different um, fields within science, it's just, you, you know, you just develop this passion for, for knowledge and the, the acquisition of knowledge. So, you know, that background was, was important in my journey to get to nuclear energy. But on the other side, I was just, like everybody else, very concerned about climate change, concerned about our planet, concerned about the future of humanity. And, you know, as much as there's so much talk about the problem in the media nowadays, very few people are actually talking about the solutions. And of course, we don't have every single solution to the problem. It's a very complex, you know, problem that has to tackle several different industries and aspects of our, of our civilization. But one of them, one thing that we, that we need to do, and we know that for sure, is to decarbonize. We have to decarbonize our electricity, we have to decarbonize our industry sectors and all the other sectors. And as I started looking into what it would take to decarbonize our, our, you know, our energy sources, I very soon realized that nuclear has to be a part of the conversation, right? Like right now, nuclear energy is the second largest source of clean energy in the world. And we can't just, you know, push it aside and say we don't need it. If we're serious about decarbonizing very soon, we need to make nuclear a part of the conversation. Yeah. Thank you for sharing. I love that. That's a great intro. Um, yeah, that was a long-winded answer, but yes. No, that's great. Thank you. And also, I want to dive a little bit more um, on your personal story. I know in one of your interviews, your recent interviews, you share the fact that you grew up in a small little village in Brazil where you have firsthand experience in living without energy security. And would you mind sharing a little bit of details on what that is like? Sure. I mean, you know, for me growing up, that was, that was the normal, right? Sometimes you didn't have electricity at night. Sometimes, I mean, sometimes no, nobody had air conditioner. And a lot of people think, oh, air conditioner is just a luxury. It really isn't. If you live in a place that's really hot, not having air conditioner really impairs your, your quality of life. And, you know, I, for example, I have low blood pressure. So whenever it was peak, the height of the summer, I would just feel really bad. I would just not have energy to do anything. And that really affects every aspect of your life. When you don't feel good physically, you can't really perform. You can't really, you know, go to school and, and give your best and so forth. Um, in the winter time, it was really cold. Like we didn't have a washing machine. We didn't have a laundry machine. I had to wash my hands by clothes, um, <laughs> by hands. I had to wash my clothes by hand. Um, we didn't have dishwasher and all of these things, they seem so small, but once you add them all together, if you don't have these technologies, you just spend so much time doing all these chores. And most of this work is, is done by women, you know, in, in developing nations and pretty much everywhere. So when you think about it, how much having access to these technologies and how much having energy security can have such a great impact in the emancipation of women because you can free them from, from you know, just doing all this household chores. And now all of a sudden they have time to study and they have time to spend more you know, with their kids or learn a new skill or whatever it is that they want to do. Yeah, and I love that you tap into all of that because it's, it is connected. Right. So many things are connected to reliable energy. Um, not to mention if you're getting your energy from a clean source of power as well. So, and that's something that at Oakville we feel very passionate about is being able to develop clean energy plants that can provide reliable, clean, and also, and also affordable power 
and and that's such an important thing that we're working really really hard at Oklo, uh, making sure that we can we can do that. So, thank you for sharing that personal personal story about you know living without. Uh, energy security because you're right it's, it ties into so many different things and I actually recently wrote an article about about that and um, and shedding some light on places like Alaska where they are because a lot of remote communities that don't have reliable power they are heavily dependent on um, real energy sources that are not very efficient um, which contributes to pollution and also not very reliable energy um, and also energy that's very costly as well. So I share a piece on our Medium channel recently and um, it was really rewarding because I got some really good feedback from local people that do live in Alaska and they agree that, you know, it's a big issue with, with living without energy security and on top of that with COVID and on top of that with, with climate change, um, you know, there are still a huge population that rely on hunting for their, for their well-being, right? So um, when they don't get the amount of salmon that they normally get, um, it's, it influences their livelihood. So, um, so yeah, it's, it's a bigger picture here. So anyway, I wanted to bring up your makeup tutorial with a twist. You totally fooled me. I was so excited. I had my phone ready with my Sephora app. I was ready to purchase everything that you were going to mention in your tutorial. But sure enough, you did talk about makeup. You talked about vision in your makeup tutorial, um, which I love that. I, I love how creative you get in your messaging and also not just creative, Creativity aside, you your messaging is always very digestible, relatable, um, which I love. And we try to do that at Oklo as well. We try to connect with our audience with a range of different platforms from YouTube, webinars, you know, however way we can connect with our audience and making sure that we can inform them with our updates and whatnot. That's that's our, the way to go for us. Um, but I'm just really curious to, to hear from you. Why do you think it's so important to infuse creativity into your messaging? Well, you know, I personally, whenever I you know, realized the steps we need to take in order to decarbonize and realize how important nuclear was, then comparing the importance of nuclear to the public perception was, was just very shocking to me because people, of course, as you know, they have very um, like irrational fear of nuclear, and part of it is because of how media has portrayed the technology throughout, you know, whatever six decades. And as I started looking into what the disconnect was between the facts and the public perception, I realized that it really was just down to communication. And it's because most people who promote the technology, most people who talk about nuclear they really are talking in technical terms. These are people who are engineers and maybe don't even understand that the language they're using is not relatable at all to, to the, the general population. So to me, it was more about how can I translate all this science, all these facts into a medium, into a, you know, into a language that people not only A, understand, but also B, want to engage with. And so I, you know, I looked through social media to see what type of content is the most popular. And of course, you know, one of them, especially for someone like me, who is a model, like one of the most popular types of content is makeup and makeup tutorials. So I had, you know, I had this funny idea, like how, you know, how can I infuse, how can I infuse fission into, <laughs> into makeup? And, you know, it's just, it's just so fun to create. It's also fun to see people's reactions. And I think it's very, like you said, it's so important for us. I mean, I don't consider myself to be in the industry, but now I kind of am adopted. But it is so important for us to communicate in a way that people want to engage with. You know, nobody wants to hear like thousand facts and numbers and graphs. People just want to hear a story and be attracted to like colorful and fun and engaging visuals. 
Yeah, so thank you for being such a great storyteller. And I've noticed the feedback that you've been getting. I mean, your reach has just become so huge now. And um, the feedback that you get must, for you as the creator must be so rewarding. I notice, you know, you go, you have, parents that love your content and feeling like they should share your content with their kids to to Katy Perry who who mentions that this is the only way she wants to learn about science so I mean that must be really rewarding um, but I mean are these the type of responses that you were expecting when you started your journey in creating these content about advocating for fission I was honestly, I was expecting a lot more pushback. I was expecting people to really, you know, criticize my work and, and doubt my intentions um, and, you know, imply that I am a show for the industry or whatever. So it has been really rewarding to see how positive overall it has been. Um, of course, like every time I see, like you said, a parent saying, oh, I... I created, I let my daughters watch your TikTok videos. We love it. The whole family loves it. It's, it's just, I spend a lot of time creating these videos and I really care so much about the cause. So it's just so rewarding. Um, yeah. And, and, you know, I still get some pushback, uh, but it's, that's what I want. I want to start a conversation because at the end of the day, if people push back, it means that they're curious. It means that they want to learn more. They're not just, you know, turning away from the content and, and shutting off. So I love when people ask me questions, even the hard ones. Yeah, I know. And that's exactly it. That leads me to my next question, because along with all the positive comments, you are getting some people that are asking questions, which is a great result, right? You want people to become curious. You want people that didn't know about these things to become curious. So um, a common thread that I'm noticing that people um, are asking questions on are related to waste. What about the nuclear waste? Um, which I find really interesting because, you know, we talk about reliable energy, energy security, something that we're really passionate about tackling at Oklo. But nuclear waste is also another thing that we're, we feel really passionate about tackling because there are technologies out there that we can take, use fuel waste. Nuclear waste is very deceiving because there's still so much energy that you can unlock remaining in fuel that was already used. We can take that. Percent, right, or something insane like that. Yeah, so that we can we can take that used fuel and turn it into clean energy for the future, which is incredible. Um, and that's a technology that we're using at Oklo. Um, so, how do you feel about that? As people become more aware of these type of information, do you think they'll be more accepting and less resistant? I mean, hopefully, right? Because like you said, the, the number one question is, what about the waste? Which, by the way, <laughs> Nick Turan, who runs whatisnuclear.com, um, created this website where if you just type whataboutthewaste.com, it you know, says all the, the options, all the things that we can do with the waste. But it is people's main, main biggest fear. And honestly, it was one of mine, too, when I didn't know anything about the technology. I thought nuclear waste was like this green goop that was just like leaking everywhere and contaminating the water and hurting people. And then once you learn that it's like the most uneventful thing, it's, this, it's stored in this huge concrete casks, doesn't go anywhere, doesn't do anything, it's just sitting there. Um, and, you know, there are solutions to the waste. There are technical solutions. There are short-term technical solutions and there are long-term, we just need to build them. And in the United States, as you know, it, it, it has become a political problem. It's, so it's not a technical problem, it is a political problem. But then if you're not content with these two options, which are pretty great, then we still have the option to recycle and reuse the fuel, like you said, you know, countries like France already do and some companies in the US want to do, like Oklo. So the nu nuclear waste is actually kind of the strength of, of nuclear energy in a way, because A, the industry is the only industry that actually is responsible for its waste. 
and that contains it somewhere and it's not leaking into the environment. And then B, that waste can then be reused as fuel. So I think once people learn about all, all of this, they can, they're going to be very accepting of the technology. Yeah, for sure. And the fact that, like, can you think of another energy source that can take already use fuel and turn it into clean energy? So, I mean, that in itself is incredible. Um, so yeah, and, and, you know, back to your, your videos about vision and whatnot, you did do a video talking about or mentioning the fact that, hey, stop, stop shutting down big nuclear commercial plants that have been doing so well in providing clean energy for the country. Um, so I want to hear your thoughts on smaller micro reactors that are using advanced vision. What are your thoughts on, on smaller reactors? I think they're all great. I think everything solves a different problem, right? Like the huge, the huge plants that we have not right now that are unfortunately being shut down. Um, these are, are plants that couldn't be built in a small village in Alaska, like you were, like you were mentioning before, right? So smaller, more flexible types of reactors, I think could be very useful for places like that. Um, and like I said, they just help tackle a different, a, a different problem. And in the way that Oklo is building the reactors to be modular as well, um, it just solves the other problem that nuclear has, which is the cost. Um, although there's so much debate around this. That's the thing with nuclear energy, everything is like a huge debate. Some people say that the cost is not that much, but let's just, you know, let's just stick with the idea that yes, cost is a huge problem um, within nuclear in industry right now. So having these smaller modular reactors just solves for a bunch of different problems. Yeah, it's a totally different market and tackling a different issue, like you said. And, you know, it's really interesting because we're talking about smaller reactors. So take ours, for example, it produces 1.5 megawatt electric. So what that means is translate to being able to power about a thousand households. So that's incredible. That's amazing for remote communities that are reliant on um, an energy source that's not very efficient at the moment. Um, you can clean up the air, provide reliable energy, and then also drive down the cost for them, which is a huge thing. Um, and we're also talking about advanced technologies and innovation that, you know, one of these reactors, you don't have to bother with it. it you don't have to refuel it for decades. You don't need human operators to ensure safety functions, um, stuff like that. So there are a lot of really interesting things that we're really excited to share details with people on. Um, so yeah, so thank you for sharing your, your insights on that. Um, the other thing that I love about what you guys are doing at Oklo is, first of all, the, the, you know, how much you value design I think that's very important because right now nuclear plants are just objectively ugly. <laughs> They're like these huge gray concrete things. You just see the cooling towers really. And I love that you guys are making this beautiful, like modern, yes. Oh, I'm quite the wrong <laughs> There it is. Cabin. And you're, you're also, if I'm not mistaken with the Aurora, you're combining solar panels with it as well to, sh to prove the point that it's not nuclear or renewables, it is nuclear and renewables. Because this is the dumbest fight within clean energy is that people are fighting or like putting nuclear and renewables against each other. That's not it. These are all sources of clean energy and we should all be together fighting the real enemy, which is fossil fuels. <laughs> yeah, thank you for pointing that out. And it's, it is really exciting because our, our co-founders have spent so much time, Caroline and Jake, they've spent so much time thinking about how it should look. You know, a lot of thought has gone into the design, the, the look of it and everything, because we want it to be something that not just provides energy, we want it to be almost like a sense of pride for a community that wants an Aurora, one of our clean energy plants, powerhouses in, in their communities. And, 
And having solar panels, again, like you said, kind of just highlighting that again, it's so important. It's not about, it's really about working together. Right, exactly. Yeah. Um, okay, so you being a model, I have to ask, do you see, do you see some interesting collaboration where you can, um, you can cross over your nuclear advocacy to the fashion industry. I mean, you know, right now as consumers, consumers have a lot of power and you, you are seeing sustainable fashion, for example, becoming very popular um, and consumers being, being more mindful about what they buy in terms of fashion or what they eat. Um, I just, I want to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, I, I mean, hopefully I can, that's a bridge I'm trying to cross, right? It's not necessarily just in fashion, but a lot of people who follow me are in the fashion industry. So I kind of am trying to, you know, get, get everything together, all of these weird things in the same room. Um, but the fashion industry has changed a lot ever since I started working. Um, it is still one of the worst polluters. The fashion industry, I think, is responsible for like 10% of global emissions, which is pretty high. And then when you think about what some brands do with their inventory, if they're not sold, they just literally burn the inventory, which is, you know, it's, it's just so sad to think because you have all those emissions that you create to just create the piece to, be, to begin with. And then at the end, if it doesn't sell, you burn it, which is like putting more emissions into the air. It's just, there's a, still a lot of things that um, could be better. I think, like you said, I do see a positive movement. It's, it's moving in the positive direction of just being more mindful of just being more conscious of the environmental impact of the clothes that you're buying or the shoes or, or whatever. But I do worry that a little bit of it could be just a trend because a lot of this a lot of these brands who are eco-conscious are also very expensive. And realistically, a lot of people around the world just can't afford it, right? So, and now with social media, you have like a push for people to just buy even more fast fashion clothes because clothes are now an item that you, ju you just use for one photo and you throw it away. Um, so it's, it's still, like I do see, I do see that it's going towards a positive um, direction, but at the same time, I see it going completely the other way where people are buying cheaper and cheaper clothing items and, and just discarding of them. In a lot of cases, throwing them in the landfill after a, a couple of uses. Um, so one thing that I'm really excited about in the fashion industry right now is um, digital clothing. And that's something that's, yeah, it, it's very interesting. It's fairly new and I'm actually working on a collaboration with a brand that creates digital clothing items. And, you know, one of the ideas is to, cre is to create clothes around isodope. So it's about nuclear energy and it's about um, decarbonization and the environment and so forth. Um, so that's one thing that I'm really excited about in the fashion industry. Oh, wow. That's amazing. Do you yeah. mind elaborating on that? So you mean you can just project a piece of clothing onto yourself. So you would take a picture, you know, at the beach with a black bodysuit and you send that picture to, to this company and you can buy an item, like a digital item from their library and they'll just 3D like impose that, that clothing item onto you. And oh, so you can wow. Picture. Yeah, so you can use that picture to post on Instagram, on social media platforms, or just send your friends. And right now, because of so many people are living digitally, right, a lot of people are just not going out to restaurants or parties or anything. So I think it makes a lot of sense. And I think it's something, it's, it, you know, it's the future of fashion. And it's the, like, what more eco-conscious way to, to do clothing? Yeah, that's, that's true sustainable fashion right there. Exactly. <laughs> That's we got it wrong the whole time. Some emissions because, you know, of their data center, but that's it. Yeah. Oh my gosh. That's incredible. I'm excited to follow along. You'll have to share more details on that. Yeah, it's very exciting. Great. Awesome. And my last question to you, as your reach becomes broader and broader, what's next? I know you have this, 
new project going on with with this clothing, e-clothing, uh, sustainable fashion. What's what's next for you? So right now, I really want to focus on keeping the existing nuclear plants open, especially in the U.S. You know, around the world is more complicated, and I live in the U.S. right now. But I I really believe that it's probably the best thing we can do for the environment right now is to ensure that all existing nuclear plants remain open for as long as possible. And people are like, what about the ones that are not safe? Of course, the ones that are not safe shouldn't remain open, but the ones that are safe should be operating. Just yesterday, we heard that two plants are going to be closed for purely financial reasons because nuclear cannot compete in the electricity markets. And it's because they're not being rewarded for being low carbon. So I, right now, I just really want to focus on educating people the importance of keeping all nuclear plants open. And then beyond that, just in general, changing people's minds about nuclear and, and getting them excited about it, showing them what an exciting technology it actually is. I talked about this in my last podcast, um, but if you think about it, we are apes. <laughs> Humans are literally apes, and we have created a technology that can harness the energy inside of an atom. How insane is that, right? And we can use that to create clean, affordable, and reliable electricity so people can have a higher quality of life. I just want people, for people to be as excited about nuclear energy as I am, so that's, that's my goal. Perfect. Well, thank you for your time, and I can't wait for your next video. And I do think you and I should talk so that I can get a list of makeup items that you do use. So maybe we can do a makeup tutorial, like a real one. A real makeup tutorial. For <laughs> Perfect. Well, thank you so much.